getting into the game. Let's bring up Carl, Solomon, Sakari, and Ryan. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. I love the enthusiasm. Thank you. Um, well, look, we getting into venture capital. It's it's everyone's got their own path to get there. Um, some go through the quote unquote traditional way. Some go through the quote unquote untraditional way. But um, you know, it comes from networking, grit, hard work, um, and just staying at it. So we have three great panelists to uh, talk about their journey. Um, timing permits, we'll open up the floor to questions. I think we have a lot of folks here that are looking to break in as well. So um, we'll, we'll make sure to budget some time for that as well. Um, so maybe we start with some introductions. Uh, Carl, do you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. So my name is Carl Leacock. Um, grew up in the Maryland area, went to Penn uh, for undergrad, uh, currently at Revolution. Uh, before that was in New York for a few years doing investment banking. Um, and so background on the fund is that Revolution started back in 05 by Steve Case, founder of AOL. So really started off more as a family office and then began to kind of institutionalize over time. So now we have about two to two and a half billion under commitments across three vehicles or fund strategies. So we have our seed arm, our ventures arm, and our growth arm. Um, I sit in the ventures arm, so I'll speak about us. We uh, focus on series A and early B, write checks anywhere from call it three to 13 million, uh, lead rounds, take board seats, uh, and really focus on all categories, but predominantly software tech enabled businesses. Um, and we're very concentrated in nature. So we do a handful of investments a year, call it two to four, and really, really dig in and really help our portfolio companies grow. And uh, that's us. Hi everyone, I'm Sakari Brown. I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. I studied civil engineering in undergrad and then decided I didn't want to spend the rest of my life working in construction. So I decided to go into uh, business school and I graduated business school last month actually. Uh, my career journey has been, thank you. My career journey has been all over the place. I started in, as an engineer at Clark Construction. I worked at Deloitte Consulting for four years, and then I worked in private equity at Camden Partners in Baltimore, Maryland. I also worked at Tedco as the rubric fund uh, manager, so to help uh, early stage tech companies impacted by COVID um, that needed some funding during that rough time. Um, and now I'm at Cambridge Associates as an investment director where I focus on private investments. So I'm more on the LP side. We also do co-investments as well, direct co-investments, but my job is more of allocating the money to the folks in the room, uh, to the fund managers and getting to know you all um, on behalf of our clients. And so um, I'm excited to be able to share a little bit about all the pivots I've made and how I've decided to be where I'm at today. So thank you. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Solomon Hailu. Uh, grew up close by Arlington, Virginia. I went to UVA for undergrad, uh, similar to Carl. Started my career in banking at Lazard uh, and then transitioned into early stage investing at Tusk Ventures. Um, today, I'm a partner at March Capital, primarily focused on growth stage investing. Uh, we have about 2 billion AUM. Uh, I cover fintech primarily, but we do enterprise software across categories. Uh, our check sizes range from 10 to 50, um, primarily between the Series B and Series D. Um, and yeah, excited to join you guys on this panel. And I'm Ryan Bernard, so I'm an associate on the team at Updata Partners, originally from Rockville, Maryland, for any MoCo folks in the, in the room. There we go. Um, <laughs> Updata Partners, we're B2B SaaS, so um, all across the stack, all verticals, growth equity, so five to 50 million of ARR revenue. Um, lightly capitalized or bootstrapped. Um, invest in our seventh fund now, which is about a six or eight million dollar vehicle. I would say similar to Revolution, we only do call it three to four investments a year, so a pretty concentrated portfolio. Um, we're pretty targeted. Uh, well, cool. So, why did Carl? Why do you want to become a venture capitalist? Yeah. So, um, interesting enough, I honestly never was thinking about VC even when I graduated and when I was kind of going through my finance roles. So I started off in credit risk at JP Morgan, uh, tried debt capital markets, and then did the pure play investment banking at JP Morgan. Um, and while I was there, it was interesting. I honestly went into that role solely wanting to do M&A and did the M&A and it was, it was fun, I enjoyed it, but what took me by surprise is that, in, you know, as you all know, in 21 and 2022, there were a bunch of various kind of growth equity rounds and VC was really popping off. And I got to work on a slew of those for, on the banking side and it got me really interested in the early stage space. Um, I felt like it was the one type of role that was, or the one type of, um, type of deal that was less transactional in nature where 
you could really help the companies grow and get to their next, their next phase, whereas a lot of the other stuff I was doing was very transactional, uh, help them sell a business, buy a company, and just kind of one and done. And that really got me interested in, in VC. And so when I was looking for, for opportunities, I wanted to kind of get back to the Maryland area where I grew up. Um, and so I ended up on, on Revolution. What's, what's been great is that, you know, I feel like you have true, the true ability to really catalyze growth and help at the earliest stages um, to ultimately make these businesses the ones that, that get bought by, you know, various companies or do IPO. And I think, I think it's, it's the one role where you have, um, you know, true opportunity to do that. So I did not have any intention of having a career in the private markets. Uh, when I was at Deloitte, I knew I didn't want to stay there for the rest of my career. I was starting to hear about VC at that time, but <clears throat> it still wasn't something I was actively looking for. So the opportunity to go to, <clears throat> excuse me, to Camden presented itself. Um, I think they needed someone that had that consulting skill set, and I was ready to make a move. I actually declined to interview about three times, and this kind of gets to what we'll talk about later of not disqualifying yourself but because you don't necessarily understand the full extent of what the VC or the PE role is. Um, but they were persistent, made it through the interview process and, and got in. And during that time, I fell in love with um, being the person on the other side, figuring out some of the, the deal terms and things like that and doing diligence on companies. I'm really into healthcare investing. And so at that time, Cam didn't do that much of it. So that was kind of my thesis for going back to business school to spend some time exploring more areas of the private markets to see what stage I wanted to be in. I interned at Steel Sky Ventures, I interned at Sands Capital, and at Anna Kappa Partners as well, and that kind of gave me a full sense of the, I guess, the, the skills that I needed, the skills I liked, the things I liked doing, the things I didn't like doing, and then ultimately I knew that this is the space I wanted to operate in, but, and I ended up deciding to take a chance and come to this side at Cambridge, where we do some direct investing on behalf of the clients, but a lot of it is between discretionary, um, like I said, investments into funds. <clears throat> so I still think that that skill set of digging into diligence, getting to know people, I'm a people person, um, and being helpful, because as an investor, no matter what side of the aisle you are, are on, your connections, your funding is all about helping um, the institution that you're working with to grow. So I, I've enjoyed that part of it. I think my experience is, is similar. Um, when I was in banking, I really didn't like it. Um, so I, what I enjoyed was the analytical part, digging into data, but I've always appreciated working in smaller teams uh, and just a faster moving environment where you're given a little more autonomy. Um, and I covered power and energy, so all the headhunters would only give me like buyout energy opportunities, which I didn't really like. Uh, so a lot of it was just looking for things that matched my personality and um, kind of my work environment. So I was actually looking at both venture and tech companies in New York City. Um, Tusk Ventures at the time was just launching, uh, and I thought what their the strategy was interesting. So I had reached out to one of the co-founders to grab a coffee. Um, he had said yes, but they had no real intention of hiring. So I pursued. Uh, I was going to work at a late stage. Uh, uh, FinTech, and then they ended up saying, hey, we actually need an associate to join, and then I interviewed. So um, it was more so, I think, my path to venture is just figuring out what I enjoy and removing elements of what I didn't. Um, so um, that was really my, my, my kind of, what kind of guided my decision making. Um, and then even within venture, uh, that was early stage, so I was doing more seed to Series A investing. Um, and then on the consumer end, and after three years of that, I wanted to get B2B experience and then join March. So although we talk about venture, it is a wide spectrum. So um, understanding what you like and what you don't uh, can really help in that search, uh, because I think sometimes we talk about it as just one asset class, but um, you know, there are different flavors within it. So Salon, why don't you keep the mic and, and maybe elaborate a little bit on your journey to VC and, and some of the challenges you faced? Yeah, the biggest challenge with VC is uh, it's a small circle of people uh, and there are a lot of barriers both in terms of opportunities and information asymmetry. Uh, so it really requires you to be persistent. Um, and it is probably, the benefit of that is, you know, I think a concise cold email can go pretty far and, you know, for me, I went to UVA undergrad, so I really leveraged that network. Um, 
and I urge you to think about the strong networks that you have. It could be school, it could be where you grew up, and draw, just draw like concentric circles and keep kind of broadening out from there. Um, and that's what really got me in the door. It was an introduction, or someone put, uh, put Tusk Ventures on my radar. Um, and I think that's, that ultimately is what helps you both at the associate level, but even when you're raising a fund, a lot of it is expanding your network and figuring out um, kind of how people can assist you. Um, and then the other piece of venture is you don't have to wait until you're in venture to think like a venture capitalist. Most of the information is out there. Um, and a lot of it is why are you excited about a, a certain industry or trend and coming up with a strong viewpoint that you can communicate clearly. Um, and I think a mistake, and we'll get into this later, but people sometimes think you have to wait until you're a VC to do all of that, but you can attend a lot of the events, you can go to the conferences, um, and doing things like that, I think, really separates you from, from, from the pack. If you're comfortable. Oh, yeah. yeah, I would say it took me a while to let go of, or to stop shape-shifting, depending on the VC firm I was at or um, who I was talking to and being comfortable like anchoring myself in the area of investing I was interested in, which was healthcare and particularly women's health. And so that from the, you know, from starting at Camden all the way through the last two or three years of, of two years of business school, that was the hardest part because, um, you know, as we're saying, it's not the easiest space to break into and you feel like, oh, I get to have this meeting with this person. Um, I don't want to risk the chance of not getting the opportunity, but the opportunity may not really be aligned to what you want to do and then you get there and it's a flop. And so um, I had to start to like release that along the path. Um, and, and when I started to do that, my experience, whether it was like actually landing the role or like uh, working and doing things I wanted to do, it started to actually come to fruition and I was spending less time kind of being something I'm not for the sake of getting the meeting or for the sake of landing the gig. I guess uh, to build on that, as my colleague said, um, you know, this industry is tough to break into. Like there, there is a lot of gatekeeping, unfortunately. Um, and so for me, the, the toughest part was, I honestly didn't know it as an option. Honestly, like when I was coming through my financial roles, like you only hear, all right, you do investment banking, you do private equity, you do corporate development, you do something else. Like I would have never thought about venture capital if it wasn't for what happened in 2021 and 2022, candidly. I would, that did not happen. I'd probably be doing buyout somewhere. Uh, so it's just interesting how life works and you know, the, the fact that I was on a team that worked on a bunch of various kind of growth equity rounds in the pre-IPO space got me interested in the space. And then from there, it, it, you know, it was you know, doing the research to kind of see like who I knew, right? So networking is a, a huge piece to kind of see like who you know within VC or someone that can kind of like point you in the right direction of how to do a pro forma cap table or all the other things that it's very hard to find online. Um, and so once you kind of get through that avenue and figure out that it's an option and you kind of get the, the baseline, then you can kind of build from there. I have yeah. a bit of a hot take here. Um, I think if you're trying to break into venture, it's really hard to find the perfect role and it's much easier to just get in and then network because you're, uh, not to uh, go against what you said, but um, I see a lot of people that oftentimes are waiting for the role that might be too perfect. And I think you need to fit culturally and you need to be excited to work there, but you have to give yourself enough flexibility to find new opportunities. So if you're waiting for the golden zone, you might be waiting for longer than you'd like versus I might join as an associate and biotech might be too niche, but um, maybe something like supply chain investing. It, not, it might not be an area that I'm personally super passionate about, but there's a lot of crossover between FinTech, enterprise software. So you kind of give yourself room to succeed. Um, and I, I think that, at least at, at the earlier stage, um, and at the partner stage, you probably don't want to jump in too fast because you know, you're kind of committing yourself to a longer period of time. Yeah, I think to elaborate on that, I can't speak for the rest of the panel, but uh, I got told no a lot when I was recruiting for, for VC. And, and, and you just got to stay after it. I think one thing to keep in mind, too, is, you know, once you're on the other side of the table, you still get told no all the time. So it's, it, all it takes is just one yes. I mean, part of sourcing and deal flow is, is chasing down CEOs and, and teams. And I'm telling you, I get told no still, like, every single day. Um, so it's just something you got to get comfortable with. Yeah, I got a lot of no's, but also, like, a lot of ghosting, um, which is unfortunate. 
So as you're recruiting, especially early on, don't take it too personally if a VC doesn't reply or if you go through an interview process and you don't hear from them, just keep it pushing, keep it moving, because um, that happens too. So Sakari, uh, what advice would you give for someone looking to break in? Yeah, I, I think the first thing that came to mind is be open. So you know, as we we're saying, like the path to where you actually want to land is it's it may not be a straightforward path, and most of us up here have kind of shared that to an extent, like where we started versus where we are. Um, I don't think I would have ever thought this is where I'd be, but I'm I'm happy of where I'm at. So you have to be open to it. I think um, when I think about the people I coach who are going through VC recruiting or have gone through it, uh, the area that uh, I ask them to do is just find a focus. Like even if it's three areas, there can be overlap and, and that helps you better when you're searching. Because otherwise, like you'll, you'll see that there's people investing in everything. And then your search is gonna feel overwhelming and you're not gonna feel like you're making any headway or making any connections. Conversations aren't, aren't deep enough or you know not going anywhere. But if you just think about like two to three areas that are of interest to you, get a little bit of smart on it, uh, follow a few companies, follow a few investors who are doing it, I think that will help with that early part of the search. And then also, um, you know, staying up to date with what's going on right now. Like, you don't, like again, you don't have to already have the role, keep up on the news, figure out your LinkedIn algorithms to make sure what's on your feed are related to the things that you care about as it relates to venture, so that if you come across somebody in an elevator or on the Amtrak or at an event, you can say, oh yeah, I saw your fund just closed or blah, 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 um, podcast as well. So it's a, an active recruiting process. It's not just submit an application and, and sit back because it's not gonna happen that way. You have to be able to be committed, be anchored, but also be prepared. Yeah. And I think building off that, it's. You know, as you said, it's, it's stay ready so you don't have to get ready as my biggest thing. Like when I was recruiting for the banking jobs or even this role, um, I was constantly studying. Because it's like the opportunity is going to come. If you shoot enough shots, like the opportunity is going to come. I know when I was trying to get into banking, for example, I probably applied at least to 50 to 100 shops. Like no issue, no ghosting, it doesn't really matter because all you need is one, as Ryan said. Um, and if you're persistent and you like are on it all the time, like when the opportunity does come, my view is like, one interview equals one job like and that's like if i feel like if you have that mindset and mentality you're going to go in differently so then when the opportunity does come you'll be ready and so it's doing the podcasting reading a couple books looking at you know harlem capital posts a bunch of stuff that you know that's that's public you know publicly out there that you can kind of get access to to understand high level like what vc is how to do diligence how to develop kind of a thesis on an industry like all that stuff so um really leveraging your resources that are out there would, would you give any tailored advice for someone with a quote unquote untraditional background looking to break in? I think for, for me, the, what I would say if, if for, um, for untraditional, I think then it's, it is doing even more podcasting and more reading, et cetera, to really have the baseline. And also like, you know, there's certain VC firms that you can maybe reach out to and do pro bono work, whether it's, you know, hey, like I, I came across this company or I've, de I've developed this thesis in, in generative AI or, or real estate tech or anything software related. Um, you know, I have this thesis work, I've looked at XYZ companies, I think there's an opportunity here. Or, um, you know, so that, that can also be extremely helpful too in terms of like reaching out to the various, various investors. Um, and thinking about you know how you can add value even if you're not in the seat right now, uh, I think is one one way. Yeah, I, I would say you also have to not think about your different background as like a handicap of some sort. Like it's it's not working against you; it can actually work for you. But the, in order for it to do that, you have to understand what you took or are taking from the current space you're in that would be valuable to where you're trying to go to. So. Like me, I worked in engineering, I worked in management consulting before getting to the private markets. At first I was like, I don't know how or why these people are interested in me, um, but let me figure this out. But when I think about like some of the themes about what I pulled from those experiences, it was I'm a people person, I manage clients well, I can, you can put me out to sell some work, we can figure it out. Um, I can typically like, I, like, I think methodically because of the engineering degree. So when it comes to doing diligence, I have a process and a system and that makes things more efficient. Um, and so those are some of the, the things I took from those previous roles that on the outside looking in, it's like what's someone that was on a construction site gonna do for, a, for Steel Sky Ventures or for Sands Capital, right? Like that doesn't make any sense. But when you start to break it down like that, that can be helpful. So just don't look at it as like, oh, 
I'd never worked in finance before. I didn't do IB, I didn't go to business school, so I'm not qualified. No, what did I get from working in sales and marketing or from being a teacher or from doing computer science that I can bring here? That's, that's how to frame it and you'll make it, it'll make it easier when you're kind of navigating the space. Solomon, can you talk about some of the mistakes people make in the application or interview process and, and what can they do to avoid some of those? Um, yeah, I would say the biggest one is like n know the firm really well that you're interviewing at, know their strategy, know their largest positions, uh, just so that when you come in they can see you or can picture you as an extension of the team. Sometimes I think people don't invest enough in the strategy. Um, just because if, if we have a conversation and I leave um, thinking, wow, you had a really good idea and you sent me two or three companies, even if they're not a fit, I can see your line of thinking and how that would kind of fit into our weekly investment meeting. Uh, so that's one, and I think uh, that's something through podcasts, um, through your network that you can really think through. And um, to the earlier point, uh, there is no blueprint or there's no standard profile for venture. People come from product, people come from finance. Uh, it's more so your perspective and uh, things you're really passionate and have high conviction on. And it's really getting that across in the interview. Unlike a banking or private equity interview where you might be handed a model and there is a right or wrong answer, here it's more, did you think about the market? How are you thinking about the challenges in the space and why does this fit our mandate? Uh, which leads to more of a conversation versus a yes, no, kind of one way, one way interview. Um, so, I mean, it's not really a mistake, but if you come into the interview with that mindset, I think you will also let your kind of natural personality shine versus feeling that you have to memorize like these answers, like where the, I don't know, 10 year yield is like, it, it's, not, it's not like that kind of interview. Carl, can you maybe describe a little bit of your, your interview process? Yeah, yeah of course. Um, it was it took at least two to three months. Um, so the way I came across the role, like, was very. It was just God, honestly. It was very random. Like one night, I happened to be on LinkedIn, uh, came across a Harlem Capital post, and then it sent me to Twitter, and I like happened to click on the role. Like it was just, it was like just God at that point. Um, there's no other explanation, honestly. And so when I was going through the process, um, someone I went to high school with actually works in the seed arm, so he. Passed my, passed my resume to the, to the VPs on the team. Um, and then from there was I had two introductory conversations with, with the VPs, a um, couple of which they, they really dug into some of the, because I have a banking background, dug into some of the deals that I was on. And fortunately enough, um, I was able to like lead the diligence process on some of those. And so because of that, I was able to really speak to you know, investor dynamics and why investors, you know, why some investors submitted term sheets, why some didn't, what were the core kind of risk areas, et cetera, um, and really like dove in on that and some of the experiences I had to make me a good fit. And uh, from there, I had, a, there was a case study where they gave us a presentation deck. Um, you had to put together a full investment memo on kind of the product, uh, technology, market, team, some of the financials, uh, do pro forma cap table to kind of see ownership and come up with various assumptions. Um, and then from there, uh, presented that to the full, full partnership. And then after that, had another kind of conversation with the VPs and then there were reference checks and all of that. And so which, what's interesting that came out of that, uh, the process, what it taught me was, you know, you need to put your bet, best foot forward everywhere. Everyone knows everybody. It just so happened that I gave them two references, but the VP hit up someone that I had an internship with my sophomore year and I only found out because I'm still cool with her to this day. She held it down, obviously, but like, <laughs> um, so it's just, it's just interesting how the world works. Uh, so then after that, everything kind of checked out and then I got the offer. Was there anything in that process that was maybe unexpected or were these all you know, pretty cookie cutter questions in a, in a process that you were, you were prepped for? Yeah, I, f I felt prepped for it. I think the one thing that was helpful is that the person I went to high school with, he kind of, um, there are a few newsletters that are really great. So like Strictly VC is a great one. Axios is another good one. There's a couple where every day you, you see like which companies have just raised. And so I was able to like look through those, figure out which seed companies raised. I know that our fund does Series A, early B investing. So could kind of like speak to a few different companies 
that I felt like would fit their mandate. And so I had like two to three ideas that, that resonated with them. Um, so that was, that was one kind of great thing. But everything else, I felt like the, the investment memo or the memo that I had to put together, it was, it was good. But I think the toughest thing for me was honestly the pro forma cap table. I honestly was just looking things up and winging it. And I think I got somewhere close. <laughs> But I think it goes back to, to the, the gatekeeping piece about this industry. It's like, you know, you do a private equity interview or something else, it's very, I think, easy to find publicly available information, whereas for this kind of job, it's a lot more difficult. Um, and so that was honestly, thankfully, I had a couple people in my network and was able to kind of get to the right answer. But I think that was, I think, one of the toughest things. Accelerated is a newsletter that has a VC recruiting guide, and it's literally like a whole multi-page guide that takes you from the very beginning of what recruiting for VC looks like to the end. And it breaks down definitions, it breaks down what to expect during the interview process. Um, I know during my interviews I had to submit investment memos, it, whether they were samples of previous work done, like redacted of course, or I had to, they gave me a company, a sim, or a presentation basically covering the details of the company, what they were raising, and I had to put together a full um, investment memo, I've had to do a cap table, I've had to do projections on revenue growth and all, the, all those sorts of things. Um, and then I have had to, in some cases, like present a, my own personal thesis on what I was passionate about, which was easy for me because it was, I'd already worked on that. And that's something that you might, that might be helpful for you is if you already know of a particular area that you're really into, um, putting, putting together a short presentation um, on the lay of the land of the market, the players who are some uh, companies to keep an eye out for. And that can be a great way for when you do those cold calls, like not cold calls, cold emails and outreach to just get the conversation going and get that VC to see like, oh, this person is already doing the work. So those were like similarly, especially compared to my private equities, private equity interviews, like that was very different, but also everything was publicly available versus with the VC stuff, it was a little bit more nuanced based on the team. And Sakari, did you apply to a job posting or, or was there some networking that went into it beforehand? Oh, I was all over the place. Um, because Not all over the place, but in the sense of I was using every, every option that I had to myself. And so I think I mentioned earlier, like I have basically configured my LinkedIn algorithm so I'm only seeing related VC things and we can talk about that offline, like how I did that. But so I saw things through LinkedIn or somebody else's post. Um, I got my, the, the work at Steel Sky Ventures through Twitter. Shout out to Mac, I don't think Mac's here yet, but like just Mac retweeted me and then a bunch of VCs reached out and say, hey, we have a space, do you wanna come work with us for a few months? So it, is, it was a combination of things. Um, and just like we talk about when we were looking at a company, right, you wanna see like revenue di diversification. And so I would think of yourself in that same way, like you want to be diversifying the outlets that you use to, to find the opportunities. Cause it was, it was a mix for me. It seems like a, a common theme between the three of you is, you know, regardless of whether you actually apply to a role or not, you, you got help from one, your network, and, and there's a lot of conversations that were had before you got in the door. And then once you got in the door, there was still some reference checks and, and reaching out to, to, to folks in your, in your network. Uh, Solomon, could you walk us through the typical VC interview process and some of the questions you might ask a candidate? Um, yeah, sure. Um, it, it will vary a little bit, uh, but I'll kind of stick to more on the getting into venture. Um, as we mentioned earlier, generally there's a filter question of like, give us like two companies you're excited about just to make sure that you're not just spamming everyone. Um, and actually take time. Um, and less is more on that one. I, I'd rather see like two concise paragraphs on like why this is exciting and why this is relevant to us rather than like a, a crazy long brief. Cause it's really just kind of getting your foot in the door. Um, and then from there, you'll usually, if it's a larger fund, meet, you'll meet with their recruiter uh, or someone on the kind of talent side um, and go through like kind of some behavioral questions, kind of why are you excited about venture? Uh, and there you just really want to get like kind of your passion and interest across. Um, and what's funny is getting into venture is a volume game, but also once you're a VC, it is a volume game. Like sometimes people think it's Shark Tank and the best companies just come to you. Like, no, you're still chasing. So it's kind of just, you kind of need to show that you're already in that, in that mode. Um, 
And then from there, uh, it's more so talking around kind of uh, what trends are you excited about, kind of give us some ideas or portfolio companies that uh, we should be considering. Uh, and then the ball gets rolling into kind of uh, an investment memo where uh, sometimes you're given an option of three or it's something where you have to identify a company uh, and kind of break down. Uh, basically, like, you know, that's a process that our associates, we would do in on any investment. So uh, talking about the team, financials, uh, modeling the pro forma, doing like exit scenarios. Uh, and then from there, um, it's again a discussion like, a VC interview is is really more of a conversation on why is this exciting and you want to just position yourself as to be thoughtful, high conviction on the idea and that you're able to effectively communicate that thesis to the broader partnership. Um, and there are many questions to get there, but that's, what, that's the goal. Um, and yeah, I would say VC interviews can move pretty fast, I, you know, as short as like two weeks if you really need to hire someone. It could also take months. So. Um, it really depends on the firm and their need. Uh, and one thing someone uh, we didn't really say is the, the best way of filtering venture recruiting is look at fund announcements and then wait like two years. They're probably back in market and that's probably a good time to get in front of them. Uh, so if you go on PitchBook or you go on TechCrunch, uh, you want to identify funds that you anticipate will raise because usually you hire ahead of kind of a fund close. Um, so that's just kind of one thing to kind of help in the, in the search process. So this question is to the group, but how important is personal brand? One, and then two, you know, how, how involved in, in, and how important is it to, to promote your brand to get into VC? I can start. I, I think your personal brand is important. Um, as we kind of hinted at, like, the ecosystem is, is smaller than you think, um, especially when you think about uh, people of color in VC. Like, we all end up knowing each other in some way, shape, or form um, through events, through deals, whatever that case is. And so you never want to be the person that somebody had a you know, sour interaction with at an event and they, they remembered it. Maybe you forgot, but they didn't. Um, or like, you know, someone that you went to high school with now is at the firm and you, you know, you, you just want to, the goal should always kind of be like, what am I putting out there? What do I want people to take away from interaction with me? And so, um, and you can, however you want to do that, like whether it's linked, leveraging LinkedIn or Instagram or Twitter or whatever app that you're using, um, if someone goes to your page, w within the first like 30 seconds, they should be able to say, oh, I know Sakari's interested in this. And it should be easy to kind of point to that. And then that should be consistent in person, right? Like I'm not a person that's gonna tell you fake it till you make it. I don't personally believe in that. I think I want, I would encourage you to think about what you want people to walk away from when having an interaction with you. And if, you know, it was behind closed doors and they only had to think about that one, that one time, what would they be able to say? And don't be afraid to, you know, shout out the things you're working on because people won't know what you're doing if you don't say anything. I know there's a big, you know, movement on like being stealth and that's cool and you want to be appropriate, but don't be afraid to share like, you know, on, on LinkedIn, hey, I'm working on this thesis or hey, I just landed this internship or just got this, you know, speaking opportunity because things come from that as well. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think, I think building off that too, um, yeah, it's really, it's really putting your best foot forward. I mean, uh, people, people talk, the finance ecosystem is small. People in VC know people that work at banks, that work at various startups, that work at other things like, like that as well. And so once you put your best foot forward, um, like the word will get out there. And so for me, like what I focused on is when I'm at a place, like make sure that it is better than when I left. And that, you know, it can vary depending on what you care about and what's important to you, et cetera. Um, but like when I am at any place, it's like I'm gonna put my head down and the first, like build my brand at least internally, right, for the first six or nine months because then I feel like after that, the best advice I got was that and then you can kind of take more liberties after that, right, take vacations, et cetera. But once I feel like your team trusts you, you have, you know, full runway to kind of like do what you need to do, like, and, you know, whether it's, you know, bring, you know, people that look like you into the firm or, you know, you find certain deals and things like that and your partners trust you to really take it seriously and, like, want to move it forward. I feel like you building a brand internally at whatever place you are in the beginning is, like, the most paramount thing 
you can do anywhere you go because then from there like you know when you're you know later on and you know you're starting a fund you're starting your company like word will get out too and obviously you need to do some of the you know branding online as well that it's also very important but if you don't i feel like understand the, the fundamentals and do you know your job well wherever you are like you can be out here talking about all this stuff but either way like that um you know you need to be doing the work I think we, we hit on the key points. Uh, reputation is paramount in this industry. Um, and the one thing I would add is, it, at the end of the day, it's really quality over quantity. Um, I think if you have a few people that are your champions um, and you're able to build personal, deep personal uh, kind of relationships, it really does set you apart. Uh, sometimes VC can be a bit uh, transactional in relationships. So when people are, um, you know, doing offshoot references or references you're giving them, that's what really kind of drives it home, especially uh, on the recruiting front. So I want to uh, give everyone an opportunity to to ask the panel maybe a, a personal recruiting question. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to stand up or, or raise their hand if they have a, a, a burning question. Oh, there are two mics here. I'll ask a question. Um, on the deep internet, I've seen things about people making their own like ghost portfolios uh, and keeping track of those portfolios, the performance, things like that, to aid in their recruitment. Have you guys seen that in your process? Have you, like, in, like Solomon, have you seen interviewees do that? Or did you guys consider that when you were interviewing? Um, ghost portfolio is uh, an interesting way of phrasing it. I think if you're tracking it, that's great and that's good enough. I'm not really looking for a personal track record uh, for hiring. And if you did, that, that's even better. Uh, but I think you're right on in the, in the idea that, you know, just be in the seat of a VC already and have your mind kind of thinking about what's coming next in terms of trends and exciting companies. Um, and you can do that either through blog posts or investing directly, uh, but you want to show that you're really committed to this. Because um, venture, I think, has been in the limelight and tech is all over the place in media. So you want to show that you're really excited about this and it's something you want to do in the long term versus this is just option B of many options. I haven't seen it either as someone interviewing someone or you know going through the process. I have seen people who may have had the privilege to angel invest um, bring up some of the things that they've worked on, especially if they're later in their career or mid-career and trying to pivot. Um, but that's how I've seen that used. I've never heard it called that, but uh, when I went through the recruiting process, I definitely had a few companies in my back pocket that I, I knew cold, and that was everything from team management you know, the space they're playing, the value prop, how much they've raised, and why it was interesting to the fund. I think you need to be careful in that sense. You definitely don't, you know, want to be pitching a fintech company to, you know, a consumer retail VC. Um, but I think as long as you have a few in your back pocket and you can recite them cold and their metrics and why it's interesting or maybe why it's not interesting, you're in a pretty good position. Any other questions? Good morning. Thank you all for taking time to speak with us this morning. My name is Josiah Matthews. I'm originally from Silver Spring, Maryland. I'm currently a senior at NYU studying sociology and social entrepreneurship. Um, my question is pretty simple, but I'm curious to know what has been the most satisfying part about being in venture capital for you all? I can, I can go. I'm newer to the game, so I mean, for me, what I, what I enjoy is like being a part of catalyzing growth. I think like that's amazing, and like I think a lot of seats you don't get to see that, honestly. Like a lot of other roles, it's you know a lot of late stage stuff. So being in a seat where you know at the some of the earliest levels you get to speak to founders that truly like are passionate, they care. Like it's exciting to get to like speak to them. You feel enlightened and enriched. You get to like learn something new every day. Um, I think that's I think it's it's a beautiful role for that. Yeah, I am thrilled to like kind of be an approachable person in the industry. And when I when I left Deloitte, my like farewell letter to everybody at the end of it, I talked about entering this new space with the hopes of 
more people who look like me feeling like they can reach out to me and it's not gonna be an awkward conversation to ask these questions about what is this world and what, what is this private markets area, what is venture, what is PE? And over the last, well, yeah, since, since I came in, I feel like I've been able to coach people, work with people and all of this folks I've worked with, whether students or full-time professionals, have found a way to make the pivot based off of my assistance and then also just being, making myself available. And so that's been the most rewarding, on top of, of course, like being able to work with companies and make investments in that space, but the people part and getting more people in here through the door, um, that's been the most rewarding. Um, I probably have to echo that. I mean, I was in New York before I moved to LA, uh, and Black VC New York was um, a handful of people. Most of us were just associates. Uh, kind of the senior black people I could think uh, when I started, it was Charles Hudson at Precursor, um, Aaron Namdi 645, and just to see the rise of new managers, uh, black managers specifically, and kind of it's real, it feels like a real changing of the guard, and there's a lot of momentum. Uh, so I think that is by far the most rewarding piece and um and i think it's grown at all levels like um through black vc and uh people who are just getting into venture all all the way to people uh taking on more senior leadership roles as uh, gps at established uh venture funds so uh, i'm super excited and um yeah i just we, we want to make sure we kind of continue the the momentum i think we have time for one more question Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Demetrius Palmer. I'm a recent Howard graduate um, and junior VC at Black Venture Capital Consortium, or BVCC. Um, and my question is, do you guys have any advice for communicating your value to possibly a sector-focused um, firm coming in as a non-expert and not really having too much hands-on experience um, as, an investor, as an investor in that specific sector? The, the first thing that can't come to mind is um, you can compare prepare that document I mentioned was is like a personal thesis. So if you're, if there's a specific area that you're interested in, basically you, you can put together this document that does a lot of the deep dive into the market, of like what's happening, who are the latest players, who's raising, who's not, what stages are they at, and how these, or how this area or how these companies can fit into that portfolio for that fund. And so similar to what we've been saying, like it doesn't, have to be the super technical thing, but what it shows and displays is your ability to do that due diligence part, which is, especially at the junior, well, depending on the fund, that's something that you might be involved in particularly, so being able to put that together and tell the story, um, whether or not they take that and make an investment in those companies, I think is, is one of the ways that you can definitely you know, show your value and show that. All right, I think we're running up on time. Any closing advice or any last words? Um, yeah, I would just say remain persistent. Um, venture is a, a numbers game, especially when it comes to recruiting um, and continue to follow up. I often think people underestimate uh, just the power of following up. If someone doesn't respond, keep checking in with them until you get or no. So that's uh, pretty much the best advice I can give you. <laughs> yeah, progress is better than perfection. Don't, don't kill yourself trying to be perfect. Just slowly make progress towards the goal. Yeah, I echo all of that. I'd encourage you guys to find these, these guys after the, the, the conference or during the breaks and pick their brains some more because they're, they're really smart people. And why don't we give our, our panelists a round of applause for, for coming today. <laughs>